I'm always delighted to have an excuse to talk to folks about the stuff I'm the most excited about. But now, thanks to the horrors of the 2020s and the, the glory and majesty of the internet, I get to talk to even more people without any of you having to commute to hang out. I mean, there's no pizza, but I, I could be wearing pajama pants. You can't tell. And I'm going to be talking to you today about one thing that I'm exceptionally excited about. And I'm going to be talking to you about code and like, yeah, code, fine. That makes sense for a JavaScript conference, JavaScript meetup. I'm going to be talking to you specifically about the value of reading code and really mindfully reading code. And what I'd like to do is bring you a couple of different approaches, a couple of different concepts from linguistics, a couple of concepts from sort of uh, literacy education, and see whether or not we can have those feeling applicable to the way we read and the way we understand code. To start off, hey, I'm Jess. I've been working in tech for roughly a million years. And one of the things I'm really excited about is I do a lot of advocacy work around access to technical education, makes sense, and access to sort of more meaningful access to yeah, work in technology for folks as well. I do have a day job as well, and I'm really excited about my day job. I work with Codesy, and we're still in stealth, we're still in beta, but we're building tooling around the concept of reading and understanding code. So this felt like a perfect fit to me. I was already a nerd about this stuff before the job. And this lets me sort of dive fully in. The work we do is around building tooling to better read and understand and communicate about complex JavaScript code bases, which if you've ever seen a big old messy JavaScript code base is a lot, well, is tone-wise, very similar to my first job. So before moving into technology, I actually worked in education, which is relaxing. I think it's quite challenging, but very rewarding. Being a former teacher, I've got some relatively opinionated takes for you all about reading, about understanding code, and why it's so valuable to, for us to be meaningfully communicating around what we've learned. And I find that in technology and talking to developers and working with developers, one thing that we often have is a hyper fixation on writing, on building, on doing the thing and doing things where our hands are on the keyboard. We want to, and we're often expected to fix that bug, ship that feature, do this thing right now. And some of this is of course linked to time, developer time is relatively expensive. So companies have a hard time not pushing us to fix that thing or make that other thing. But I'd argue that there's also a cultural component that's developed around the way we think about code and the way we encounter it. While we do have space in our mental models for the concept of a, a maintainer on an open source project or on a, on a project overall, and that's someone who actively shapes and shepherds the code around our project, most of the language we use around programming is focused on productive tasks, those hands-on keyboard tasks. Even a developer's chiefest joy, deleting lines of code, is an active, hands-on experience. And what I really want to focus on this time, this uh, session, isn't the tappy parts of our job, but the reading, the ingesting. And as a dedicated old-school book nerd, I'd love to say, hey, I'm going to talk to you about reading code for the joy in it. It's what's important for you. But that's only not only not practical, like I'm not going to win many hearts and minds by saying read, it's cool. But it's also not being very honest about the real value here. I want us to be more mindfully reading code and applying different strategies to read code because it lends us more valuable understanding. The, my key argument, which I fear you're going to hear me just raise again and again along with my little fists, is that reading and intentional reading is needed for the type of deep understanding to do great things. You all are adults and you're going to make up your own mind for yourselves. So instead of focusing on trying to sell you, hey, reading code is good for you, I'm instead going to step back 
and focus on some of the approaches that we might borrow from linguistics and we might borrow from education that might be exciting to apply to mindfully reading code if you did decide you were so inclined. And you might, reading, I don't need skills to do reading. After all, isn't reading just reading? <gasps> Reading's just reading. I mean, of course you already know how to read code. You read it as you write it. Yeah, I want for us to shift our focus and to have reading not just be an incidental part of your workflow and an incidental part of writing, but really be a focused part of what we're doing here. The first concept I want to talk to you about is intensive reading, and it's exactly what it says on the tin. It is a lot. Intensive reading is a concept oh, that we pull in from linguistics. So linguistics, the study of language or foreign languages or teaching language is applied linguistics. It's language stuff. And intensive reading has a really a sort of a cousin in literary criticism, which is called close reading. You could probably get away with using these terms interchangeably if you wanted a linguist and a literary studies person to yell at you. So we'll try and keep these separate. They're similar in practice. And this involves deep focus. You want to be intense on that reading. And that's deep focus, often of a relatively short section of text or code, in large part because it's hard to really deeply focus. And you're reading in intensive reading for a set task. Say, hey, I want you to do this thing. Here's a passage. So if you think back to primary school, an example many people might have encountered is, here's a paragraph. Can you go through and circle all the nouns? If you're looking at something a bit higher level, maybe with close reading as opposed to intensive reading, with literary criticism, it might be, hey, read this passage and then write me a short essay about the thematic use of butterflies in it. And this one's really, well, it's relatively easy to pull out several examples of how we might use this in code ourselves. If you know there's a bug in a section and you're having an angry, maybe you're a better person than me. If I'm having an angry little hunt for it, I think that this equates really closely to intensive reading. I might also suggest that if you're, maybe you all are much better programmers than I am and you never have to do this, but if you're hunting for a typo, say maybe your text editor has let you down or you've done something uh, with wiggly brackets where your sense has left you, I, I might argue that kind of, okay, I'm going through this section with great intensity, with great detail for this task might count as well. And I think that fretting over cursed sections of code uh, count as well. So if you've ever encountered a piece of a code base where someone says, oh, hi, don't ever touch this because everything breaks, the kind of meditative inspection that you might apply to this, I think counts as something very like intensive reading. Um, intensive reading is also kind of miserable. Intensive reading for most people, if you're special, if you're magical, if you love this, if you can do this for hours, come see me after class because I must know your secrets. But most people, most learners or most people working can't keep this up for long. It doesn't bring joy into our hearts. Peering deeply into a paragraph, or a six line segment of code isn't gonna feel fun. It's work and it's hard work. I've actually got an example of an intensive reading exercise that I completed relatively recently. And this is gonna be a little tiny bit small, but the code is actually from Open Whisper Systems and they're the good people who make Signal. And the good people at codereading.org, which we'll talk about a little bit later on, I'm not affiliated with them. I just think they're brilliant gave me this exercise and they said, Jess, go through, you have a set of relatively small amount of time, go through this section of code and highlight the lines that you think are the most important. Okay. I'll put some squares. Go ahead and pick the variables that you think are going to be the most important here. Okay. And then go ahead and show quickly what you think these do. Here are sort of the language tasks, but represented in code. It feels like homework because it is often work. But if you want something that's a little bit easier on the soul, let's talk skimming and scanning. And this is going to feel really familiar as well, not just because this is something we very commonly do with code bases, but also this is stuff we've been doing 
in our in our sort of literate adult lives, since we were little tiny kids, we first learned about skimming as primary school students, like little babies, like, oh, just read this quickly and get the gist. And that's the deal. Just cast your eye over this. So read it quickly for skimming. Scanning's a bit different. You're just literally looking at the, the text or looking at the code to find where you need to focus. And you're looking for general understanding here. It's not like intensive reading where you need to really get involved. You just, I'm very old. So this text, this uh, slang is probably over already, but it's sort of a, a very general vibe check for text or code. And we've got some examples from code in here as well. If you're looking over a new code base, so say, hey, welcome to your first day at Glitter Corp. We're so excited to have you. By the way, here's the code base. You might want to skim in, just be like, oh, hey, what's going on here? How is this structured? How do we do? How do we name things? Whereas scanning, you might want to scan to find a function. Oh, hey, this thing is broken. Where is that? Or a section or a module. Scanning is literally just searching quite quickly. Skimming and scanning, while separate, similar feeling concepts, are the spiritual opposite of intensive reading. Intensive reading feels like a lot of work. Skimming and scanning, they're not cognitively intensive. Your brain, with a little bit of practice and with some familiarity with code, can relatively happily sort of skip along without feeling tired and without feeling, if you're me, dejected in the way that intensive reading often leaves us. And I want to talk about uh, a concept that sort of almost combines the two. Extensive reading is such an exciting concept. So this is something I use myself. So I'm a language learner, having been a linguist, I'm not very good. And it's a bit more involved than skimming or scanning, but really satisfying. This is a concept from linguistics and it's relatively recent. I think we've been talking about extensive reading. Oh, I love to be wrong on a recorded talk. So I'm going to say from the seventies, uh, nobody tell crash if I was wrong. And this, it, looking at this from a linguistic perspective, the idea is, Hey, you're a language learner. Let's have you read a lot for fun. So here are some texts that are an appropriate level. They're not too hard. They're not much harder than your current level, but we're just going to have you read a lot and chill out. You don't have to look stuff up. You don't have to take notes. Just sort of enjoy it, which is absolutely what you want. And a lot of the, the value of this is often debated, but a lot of the value from extensive reading is assumed to come from learning from context. You say, hey, we're not going to have you look things up when they're new, but we think that you're just going to, sort of going to get them through cognitive osmosis a bit. This is really supposed to be an enjoyable exercise. This isn't supposed to feel hard. This isn't supposed to feel like work. It's really about making reading not suck for a learner, which I'm very holistically about. And when you look at this concept as a whole, hey, we want to see people reading. We want to see people reading for fun. We want to see them working with texts that are the right level, so not too hard. And we don't want you to have to look things up. We don't want you to have to take notes. We want you, don't want you to do tasks. How magical is this? And if we're looking at an example from code, the exciting thing is I don't have any. I'm absolutely enraptured by the idea of what would extensive reading principles look like if we applied these to code, if we applied these to non-human language, that sounds a bit alien, but non-human language texts. And it's my very gentle, my un immodest, modest proposal that this would rule if we could determine, if we could create tooling, if we could make processes if we could create a culture where hanging out and reading some level of appropriate code was enjoyable, if we could find a way to make this fun, if we could find a way to make this not grinding, I don't have a clear idea of what that would do for our individual skills, what that would do for our shared understanding and what that would do for our ability to communicate technical problems. 
And having thought about this a lot, this is a big part of why I wrote this talk. So saying, hey, here's this thing I've been thinking about a lot. I imagine many of you, most of you, all of you are quite a bit smarter than me. Here's an idea. If you can think of any way that this fits into your workflows or into your learning, I beg you to come back and tell me. Within technology, we already have a lot of models and a lot of social models and individual models focused on experiences of writing code. So we've got these social models. I think that hackathons are probably the most humane, non-work, artificial environment for writing code. And these are a usually time-limited, back in the before times, they used to be in-person events where you get together, you have a relatively small amount of time, um, and you have to try and build a thing, usually green fields, usually a brand new project. Uh, and this isn't conducive to doing a lot of writing, but we do have this model for collaborative experiential work in tech, in program that's focused around writing. And if you're looking for something that's individual instead of group, and I don't want to say more evil, so I'll say less humane. We've got timed code tests or timed coding environments. If you've never had to do one of these, it's because you work at rational places and don't interview at terrible. And I hope it doesn't feel like I'm picking on just these three because there are dozens of companies that offer these. But these are folks that build off the shelf time code tests for when you apply for a job. This is the kind of exercise I'm thinking about. This is a, they say assessment, it's a test. But I use this as an example alongside hackathons to say we do have models within tech for us having learning style experiences around writing code. How would our experience change and what kinds of things could we do? to shift these around reading code. We already have some, so we've talked about the well-established models in tech around writing code socially and individually outside of a professional experience. Outside of tech, we do already have these established models to choose from for reading. Reading circles and reading clubs and other social groups around learning have existed far longer than you or I. And I'm really excited around the idea of what would happen if we took these models and applied them to better understanding code. While I was looking at this problem, while I was thinking around it, I ran into some brilliant people who are just out there, apparently psychic and trying to solve all of my worries for me. So Felina, who's a, a fabulous professor and Katja, who's absolutely brilliant as well, I believe also a professor, started a code reading club, a reading circle of sorts for code. And this is really intentionally designed. So this is a, I believe an eight part meetup series that has all of the learning materials. They have the code ready, they have the exercise ready, they have the lesson plans ready. And you can bring this into your workplace. You can bring this into your academic setting. If you've got friends, if your friends are very much like me, which I, I good, good for you being friends with weirdos. If your friends are really into the idea of like, oh, what would it be? What would it mean for our understanding to more closely examine? You can run these yourself just based on their lesson plans. They're out of the box and go. And I'm so excited that, that these really exist. A sort of adjacent plug is one of the originators of the code reading meetups also wrote this very good book that's just come out about cognition and how our brains work and want to work in programming. It's not exclusively around reading and code, and I don't get a kickback for it or anything. I just found this personally very enjoyable and useful. I confess that I'm trying to sell you on the focus of reading code partially out of a good old fashioned nerdy love of reading, but reading better and reading more mindfully offers us real practical benefits. The goal behind us reading, writing about, or, or talking about code is really the synthesis of shared understanding. Any of us with enough experience have worked on a project that doesn't have any shared understanding. If you're brand new to the industry or you're just getting into the industry, maybe you haven't experienced that yet. Oh, in which case I have got some bad news, my love. It's going to happen eventually and it's going to be miserable. But how could better reading practices around code make us as individuals 
more resilient to these projects without shared understanding? And how could reading driving our own understanding be better pooled to create shared understanding and sort of prevent these doom-like projects? I want to take you way, way back. Um, and I want to talk to you really briefly about the four core language skills. And these are something we talk about sort of in, in really early education. So you would have started doing these well before you entered any kind of school. And the, these are listed out in the order in which we generally learn to do them in our home language, our first language. So we generally listen before we speak. Yeah, right. And then our reading skills develop more quickly than our writing skills. Also fair. Knowing this and having looked at our bias in technology for sort of hands-on keyboards, I feel that we're doing ourselves a disservice in skills development. We know that our passive skills develop before our active skills in human languages and the way we interact with human language. I would politely but gently argue that in programming languages, in technical language work, that there's a great potential, there's a great benefit to be had by developing these passive skills. And I want to very gently, I, I suppose, workshop out with you if that's not a bit rough. I want to sort of workshop out a proposal for four core skills that would en enable us to focus on these passive skills and then translate them into active skills. And I confess that my thinking about this is really early. I'm a terrible speaker and a terrible person. And I've joined you in large part because a lot of you are a lot smarter than I am. And I genuinely want your opinions. So here are my to be amended four core skills for technical work. I think the first one you're going to be doing is reading code. Yeah, of some kind that may be embedded within a tutorial. And we've been talking about it a lot during this talk. We can just go ahead and yeah, we, we've got reading code. And then I think you're going to be writing code. And I, I think that most folks I'm talking to are going to be like, yeah, I get it, Jess. And look at what an absolutely clunky way I've chosen to say this. Like, please help me if you have a better way to say this. But here, these are any activities where you're actively taking in information about the code base or information about the technical problems or information about the technical domain that isn't directly from the code base. This could be reading documentation, taking an online course, listening to a coworker describe the problem. And the next one, still clunky, but it's going to make a lot of sense. This is active non-code communication. It's where you're saying the thing or writing the thing. If you are one of the, the few and beautiful chosen few who loves to write documentation, that's this. It could be streaming, which would be a, if you're live streaming yourself coding, that could be a really interesting combination of you reading code, because you've got to read it while you write it, writing code, and then actively engaging in non-code communication. So talking about what you're doing as you're doing it. <laughs> I suppose if you're reading the chat, it's also passive non-code communication. How exhausting. Or making a video or talking to your coworkers would count as one of these as well. All of these, all of this sort of different approaches and academic joyous fluff. I think, yeah, if we take ourselves too seriously, we've gone a bit off. Off base. But all of this, I'm really trying to, to bring myself and bring all of us to my big goofy dream. Everybody has a weird dream. Billionaires want us to go to Mars. Precocious children want puppies. Most of us have a big goal somewhere in us. My big weird goal is continuous understanding. What would it mean to have an environment where you're constantly really reading, constantly learning, and constantly adding to, yeah, what's possible for you to understand? And for me, continuous understanding isn't just, I want to continuously understand this. I want to continually add this in, but 
as you're learning, as you're reading, and of course writing, that you're generating artifacts of understanding as you go. It's a very specific, very weird dream. And one that I confess that I stole the language from my employer. The ability to have this sort of true north in, what would it look like in education or what would it look like in collaboration for ongoing shared understanding to be the goal is weird, but magical. This has been a little bit teachery. So let's talk homework. I'm not your boss and I'm not your mom and I'm not your teacher. I can't make you do anything. And I, I don't think I'd be much inclined to try. So this is more of a gentle invitation than actual homework for any folks interested in trying this out. The easy stuff is, hey, try to intentionally think about reading code during your daily work. So if you find yourself doing intensive reading, oh, wow, cool. I'm doing some intensive reading. Yeah. And try to identify when you're using different skills around understanding and reading and selfishly, especially if they're ones I haven't thought of. If you're like, oh, I don't have a word for this. But I often do this, or I often do that with reading code. Yeah, identifying the skills, identifying the approaches uh, seems so valuable around intentionality and reading code. If you don't mind, if it's a bother, please try one of the reading techniques I've outlined here. I'd love to hear whether or not, yeah, how applicable and how valuable you find them, because I've mostly just been torturing my team with them. It's not my project, but I love it. If you've got the time and interest, please check out one of the code reading workshops from codereading.org, I believe. And most selfishly, please, I beg you, bring me back any feedback you're comfortable with. You could come back and be like, Jess, I tried some of these reading techniques and they're rubbish. And I'll be like, oh, thank you. This is still really valuable information. And because ongoing education, ongoing learning is a two-way street, I've also got homework coming out of this talk and coming out of future work, my homework for me, for everyone, for the, I was about to be a bit grand. Oh, my homework for the wider tech community. Like, nah, my homework for me is to continue to read about and understand and teach about where I can reading and code. And if, and when folks are lovely enough to give me feedback, I promise to continue to integrate them into my understanding and feedback. Uh, and I promise to keep working on building tooling around reading and understanding code. I did mention that I work at CodeC as a very short and shameless plug. We are in beta, so we're still working on some tooling to help people read and understand uh, JavaScript code bases. I'm such a big nerd about feedback. If anybody wanted to test this out, I'm super, my boss isn't looking, I can, yeah, I'll give y'all access. I'm super happy to give you free beta access. It's free money-wise, but I will lightly tax you by politely asking you with feedback if you do try it out. If you did want to try it out or give me feedback, you find me at jess at codeseed.i. Because I am a big old nerd, I've gone ahead and sourced, uh, sourced out where all my illustrations and diagrams come from, and also where you can learn more about the different concepts listed here. Fabulous. Are there any questions I can answer for anybody?